because I, I welcome this opportunity to chat with everybody, and thank you for taking time out of your evening and uh, giving the old man your ear. Here's, here's really what, uh, what has transpired. You know, if you uh, look back when you bought a home, you went to the bank and you filled out some paperwork. And one of the pieces of paper that you signed was your mortgage. And it was notarized and it was recorded with the birth deeds, register of deeds, or uh, uh, clerk of, of uh, county, clerk of court, whatever. Okay? And the other piece of paper that you set, filled out and signed was a promise, and let's say you borrowed $400,000. Well, you signed a piece of paper where you promised to pay that man across the table or his representative $400,000 over a period of 30 years or 20 years or whatever the term was. But you signed that piece of paper, and it was not notarized. But it was like signing a blank check. But it was a promise to pay which made it a negotiable instrument. Now, when you... When you gave, signed that paper, you thought that the bank was going to give you $400,000. That's what you thought. Well, when you signed that piece of paper, what did they give you? They didn't give you anything yet. You just signed the document, and that piece of paper became an asset for that bank. It was now an asset that they owned. You no longer owned it. Yours was a promise to pay. So that asset was now $400,000 of theirs, and here's what they did with it. They didn't give you any money yet, but they took that asset and they created a bond, just like you would bail your nephew out of jail. They created a bond, and that bond went, they took it to the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve gave them approximately 10 times the amount of your promise to pay. Now, let's say your promise to pay was 400000 The Federal Reserve create, uh, gave them a credit of about $4 bucks. Now, how much money have they put up? They have put up absolutely zero. They leveraged, leveraged, and the, the technical word for it is monetized, but they leveraged your promise to pay to create four million bucks. And they still had your promise to pay. They kept it. They just created a bond. They then took your promise to pay to another party, and we'll call that party a wholesaler, and that wholesaler took it to what we call an aggregator or trustee. And it was then sold to a trust. And 95% of the trusts are in New York. So it was sold on Wall Street. Well, where did the money come from for this note? Where did it come from? Well, the trust filed before you even applied for that note. The trust filed what we call an 8K filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission, and we'll call it the uh, Rosado Trust. And they told the Securities and Exchange Commission that they were going to uh, uh, sell investment certificates, and they were uh, uh, what we call mortgage-backed securities, or they were called CDOs, collateralized collateralized debt obligations, whatever fancy term they called it, that note was, was, was the security for these folks to induce certificate holders or investors. Uh, let's just say the folks that are listening to this phone call. Let's say they represent the uh, uh, school teachers in their area. So the school teachers' pension plan invested ten million dollars each into this trust that was backed by your promise to pay. So they were they were given 
oh, let's say 6% return on their investment. But you were paying maybe 7%. So the trust was earning money. Okay? Now, those certificates, okay, that were purchased by the investors, okay, that money went back to the bank that you signed that promise to pay with, and that's where the funds came from for you to buy your house. Wow. Wow. Listen to this for a minute. That piece of paper that was never notarized traveled all around the world, gathering a lot, a lot of money. It created $4 million for the bank in credit on your signature. It also induced a lot of school teachers' pension plans or firefighters' pension plans to invest into that trust. They got an investment certificate, and the funds came backwards to the bank, and the bank then uh, through the uh, title company, they provided the $400,000 to purchase the house. Good deal. Very good deal. For who? For the bank. They got $4 million in credit and didn't put up a nickel. Now, now, the trustee for this trust, he is uh, provided what we call a pooling and services agreement. That's his uh, management book. That's his rules. That's what he has to follow to comply with the SEC rules. So in that pooling and services agreement, there's a clause in there that says, if you fail to pay your mortgage, they, they uh, uh, entered into an insurance contract so that if that mortgage wasn't paid, the insurance company would pay it. But the money wouldn't go to you. It would go to the trust. So then we call that a credit default swap, and the insurance company is, listen to this, A. I G. Now, when you got in trouble and, you know, you lost your job or your overtime or for whatever reason, you tried to contact the bank and you got the runaround. You ended up talking to this person, that person, submit these papers, oh, we lost them, submit them again, and all that crap that goes with it. But you were told we can't help you until you're, 90 days late. Everybody's heard that. Well, guess what happened on day 91? On day 91, the insurance policy that the trustee entered into with AIG triggered a payoff, and the trust received the full amount of the note, regardless of how much you've paid on your mortgage, they got the full amount of the note. So if the note was insured for 400000 the trust got 400000 But here's a mystery here, and I'll explain it as easy as I can. The Federal Reserve allowed the trust to leverage that $400,000 note 30 times. So they created 30 different levels. Now your $400,000 note is purchased by other lenders and along we go. So let's go back to the default. The AIG paid off the note when it was 91 days late. So at this point, who has lost any money? Nobody except AIG or insurers like that. Sol Smith, Solomon, Barney Brothers, and all that stuff. Now, someone attempts to foreclose. And let's say the lender that you got the note from, they're going to foreclose on you. Or the trust is going to foreclose on you. 
Or let's say it's Wells Fargo acting as trustee for Bear Stearns Trust. Well, they're trying to steal the house because nobody has any skin in the game. They've all been paid commissions, and they're, they've been very successful in stealing houses. Hmm, what happened here? Well, I sat in the Fort Myers courtroom many times, and I watched folks, average folks, lose their house in five minutes because they didn't have an idea of what to do, didn't know where to go for an answer, and didn't have any money. Now, in this foreclosure arena, so I'll call it a football field, in this field of litigation, the only players are the consumers who have enough money to pay an attorney. And what is he doing? He's delaying the time so that you maybe save a couple of months of rent or, or mortgage payments. But at the end of the, game, end of the day, when you pull the shade down, turn the lights out, he wins a dismissal without prejudice, which means the bank that is foreclosing, who doesn't have any skin in the game, will come back again in a month and try to foreclose, try to foreclose again. MERS uh, technically is Mortgage Electronic Registration Systems. They were formed by the banks, and the mem banks became members. And MERS, at the closing table, is named as the nominee lender. They take they take possession of the mortgage electronically, not the hard copy, but electronically. MERS, their theory is and was that by they being the nominee lender and having possession of the mortgage electronically, they believe that the note followed the mortgage. And there are some judges who don't understand this who agreed with that. However, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1872 said if the note and the mortgage are separated because one secures the other, if they're separated, they're both null and void. And to simplify it, if you were going to buy my car, you're not going to give me the check until I give you the title. The keys to the car are one thing, but the title is another thing. Now, MERS took possession of the mortgage, but they could not take possession of the note because the Kansas Supreme Court ruled that they are not a lender. With that being said, your loan was bifurcated. That's a legal word bifurcated right at the closing, but you didn't know that. Now, that means your type, chain of title was broken. So, fast forwarding ahead, we simply said, and this uh, workbook that I created, and I'm the only layman that I know of, and I've been told this, that's ever been approved by the Florida Bar to teach attorneys about this subject. I've subsequently been approved by the Georgia Bar, the Wisconsin Bar, the Nevada Bar, and other states to follow. So that's quite an accomplishment for a little white-haired old man to be able to be certified to teach attorneys. What you need is a securitization audit, which follows the paper trail from the time you closed, until it enters into the trust. And a Bloomberg financial report that pulls out all of the financial information about the trust. When you have that information and it's accompanied with an affidavit sworn under the penalty of perjury, you now have evidence you now have admissible evidence to the court that 
the note was paid off when the insurance or credit default swap was triggered. Well, if the note was paid off, who is damaged? Who is damaged? Nobody. The only logical people with a claim to that house, only logical people, would be the insurance company that paid out the claim. But now, here's the, here's the uh, end of my story tonight, and then I'll open it up for questions. If you have your vehicle insured by, let's say, GEICO, and you total it, GEICO will write you a check for the value of the vehicle, but who owns the salvage rights? Think about that for a minute. Write your question down. Think about it. The salvage rights are owned by GEICO. They then part it out or salvage, sell it, whatever, so they can minimize their losses. Well, in the foreclosure arena, the insurance company is GEICO, and if they paid off the certificate holders, then they would have a claim to the house. Logical. Except, except, they insured unsecured notes. Remember, at the closing table, MERS became the nominee lender. It separated the note from the mortgage. The U.S. Supreme Court says that they're separated. They're both null and void. Well, GEICO insured unsecured notes because the notes that were not accompanied by the mortgage or vice versa. Therefore, they had no claim on the wreck or the house. Whew. Now, so essentially they're double well, dipping, or, or, or they're double dipping and triple dipping. Ab even. Absolutely, and today Geico has a big time lawsuit against Bank of America because Geico. I'm not Geico. My God, when you get my age, you can invent words. AIG has a major lawsuit against Bank of America because Bank of America defrauded them on the quality of the loans. The loans were rated AAA by uh, Standard & Poor's or Moody's or whatever, when in fact they slid into that pile of loans, they slid, slid in some toxic loans, some, some uh, uh, marginal loans, and GEICO ended up paying based on misrepresentation. Wow, what a hornet's nest. You, here's what you do, and I did this with Regions Bank. I walked into the bank, and I said to the girl, I want to talk to the president. The bank has dirty diapers, and they really smell. Well, he's in conference. I said, it's no problem. I'll just drop the diapers right here. In less than 30 seconds, he comes out of his office, and he said, I overheard the conversation. What's the problem? I said, you've got dirty diapers. There's fraud in, this, in these loans. Now, what do you want to do? Do you want to litigate or do you want to negotiate? And so he called his legal department, and I said, here's the proof. You people have already been paid. What do you want to do? And it stopped all the activity in court because you had proof, and that's the value of the securitization audit in the Bloomberg Financial Report. So if I were a real estate investor, I would not rely on any modification because you're dealing with someone who doesn't own the note. Remember, remember earlier in the conversation, a lawyer here in Cape Coral and a real estate broker, they were partners. They paid the bank $156,000. And Randy, I think you saw the article. And the bank didn't mm -hmm. own it. So if I'm an investor, how the hell do I know who owns the who owns the note? So the only way I can find out who owns the note so I can sit across the table and cut a deal 
is to flush them out of the woodwork. And how do you flush them out? You sue them. Wow. This old man's got a lot of enthusiasm, okay? The ability to walk into the bank and say to the bank, to the president of the bank, you have dirty diapers. Do you want to litigate or you do you want to negotiate? And they always would rather negotiate. And then it's a question of how much money they will take based on today's value. So if a if a home had a mortgage of four hundred thousand and it's worth two hundred thousand today, banks are negotiating today's value. Now, can the individual homeowner negotiate? No. No. Because then the bank says, Well, why don't you pay me in the first place? 